On this episode of AvTalk, we mark two years since the crash of Ethiopian Flight 302 and the beginning of a years-long effort to fix the 737 MAX and return it to service. And Air Baltic CEO Martin Gauss joins us to discuss how the airline has managed through the pandemic, including becoming an all-A220 operator almost overnight. Hello and welcome to episode 107 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik, here as always with... Jason Rabinowitzson. Hello, Ian. Are you still thinking about flying down to Antarctica like I am? Absolutely, I am. I would be lying if I said I hadn't planned on how to do it next summer season in Antarctica. So I guess next winter here in Chicago. Yeah, still still thinking about it pretty much a week later. Yeah, don't even need your passport. And that's good because I don't even know where mine is anymore. And you can't really use it now anyway. No, on that note, actually, I am now, I have eclipsed one full year without getting on an airplane, which is super, super depressing. One year and two days. We're both a year, over a year out now then. That's, uh, yeah, that's just a, over a year. A I mark. actually, though, just last night, I, I booked my first flight post, maybe not post pandemic, but anticipating my chance at getting a vaccine in the near future, hopefully before my mid-June departure date. We'll see. And if not, then I guess you take advantage of the generous and flexible arrangements that most airlines continue to offer. Yes, the airline industry has become that, that sounded, so accommodating out of nowhere. <laughs> that, that came out sounding like an ad and I totally did not mean it to. But it, it's pretty much, at least in the US, I think every airline at this point is, is offering free change and cancellation. As, there may as be long a, a as you difference. promise to, uh, yeah, as long as you promise to, to keep giving us your money eventually, you can do whatever you want with the ticket. Well, well that's the thing. They already have my money and I'm not getting it back. Well, that's um, what I'm saying. Like, just, is, is, the, I can the, use the airline is saying, point. yeah, the airline is saying, as long as you let us keep your money, you can fly whenever you want. Exactly. So I'm looking forward to that cautiously, very cautiously optimistic. Um, probably should have done it for July instead of June, but we'll, we'll see. Gives me something to look forward to. Exactly. I have not yet booked any travel, but but I'm itching to do so. And so I've, I've been performing speculative research to see what prices look like and things like that. And they're, they're still uh, encouraging. I guess from a consumer perspective, yeah, uh, maybe not from a revenue management perspective. Well, it depends. A lot of people have asked me, "Are, are flights stupid cheap these days?" And it depends where you're flying in what region, because in a lot of places in the world, capacity is so ridiculously reduced that whatever is left is quite expensive. So I, I was looking at uh, New York to Seattle, and then some days it, it was close to five hundred dollars round trip in economy, which is well above what it used to be. But then on other days, I could fly $300 one way in business class and in JetBlue Mint. So it's really all over the place right now. So there's no guarantee that anything is cheap. Yeah, we were finding that out as as we were talking about uh, your purchase and some of the other places that that are, are looking good in the in the interim. But we'll see how things shake out and hopefully everyone gets vaccinated as quickly as possible and we're you know, in a couple months' time talking about doing a podcast episode, not from our homes, but really from anywhere else. Literally anywhere. So we had some folks write in to the podcast email and, and message us on Twitter. And I think I got one ACARS message from someone that asked us to to reintroduce ourselves for folks who may not have started listening to the podcast from episode one or, or very early on when we talked a little bit about you know who Jason and I are and, and what we do. And, and I thought that was a, a perfectly a reasonable request. And, and so why not? I am the Flight Radar 24 Director of Communications, which means I have the best job in the entire company. I get to play with Flight Radar 24 all day and tell people about it and then sit down with Jason once every week or two weeks and talk about airplanes and what has happened in the world of aviation. You're just living the dream. I really, really am. 
And so this is one of the the many things that I do. A lot of it is also, you know, working on our you know social media stuff blog that we that we have that uh, everyone should go check out if they haven't already we we put a lot of great stuff up there that we don't necessarily talk about in the podcast all the time and i also get to to tell people about all the great stuff that we're doing with the website and the apps and in normal times I get to go enjoy the company of other like-minded people. So for instance, conferences and things like that. So that's a little bit about me. And I will let uh, Jason ramble on uh, about who he is. So I am not an employee of Flight Radar 24. I do not get paid to look at Flight Radar 24 and tweet about it and blog about it as some lucky people such as Ian does. I'm very jealous of that, by the way. I Once upon a time, I got my start in the industry actually writing about the passenger experience on board. So things you interact with, the, the Wi-Fi, the entertainment systems, the seats, all that good stuff you, you touch and interact with on board the aircraft. And I did that for a few industry publications and sites. And for the past, I guess, seven, six, seven years now, I've worked for a company that actually aggregates data on all that information and sells it to uh, places where you actually book flights. So uh, Expedia, Google Flights, Skyscanner, Sabre, if you're a travel agent, um, our, our company shows you all of the information uh, about what is available on that specific flight on that day. So what entertainment you'll have, what seat you'll have, what Wi-Fi you'll have. It's all very interesting stuff, at least to me. And all of this stuff is, it started off as a hobby for me and it's uh, slowly morphed into my entire life and now I work for this uh, industry owned company that it makes a and now I make a living out of uh, basically turning that information into usable data that passengers can use to book flights and know what they're getting into ahead of time I so very rarely these days know what I'm getting myself into ahead of time. So I always appreciate that. I don't think you're supposed to anymore. <laughs> it's just that's just part of life now. It just happens. Yeah, I like it. So that's a little bit about who we are as far as kind of our, our professional backgrounds. Uh, I think I speak for Jason when I say we're also both very much into aviation from a young age. I'm not sure when Jason started staring up at the sky at everything that went over. But for me, that was about five years old when we moved into the, the childhood house that I grew up in that was at the end of the runway at O'Hare. So I uh, I went to bed every night with the uh, landing lights coming into my bedroom and, and aircraft going over. So that, that's kind of where I got my start as far as really liking things that fly. Yeah, a bit similar for me, but I, I guess I was a late bloomer in that regard in that I also grew up just outside of JFK in New York, not far from the airport, and never really paid any attention to it until probably my late college years or even postgraduate years when I was no longer living in that area and I, I suddenly realized that something w was missing over my head. There were no airplanes where I was living and that, that part of my environment that I grew up with was gone and now I was suddenly very interested in, in what it was over my head all those years. So I, I never really paid too much attention to it back when I was growing up but I knew that Sunday mornings when the house was very loud and it shook violently out of nowhere. That was the Concorde going over my head. And when I was in the parking lot at a shopping center outside the airport and all the car alarms went off, that was the Concorde. That was pretty <laughs> much the extent of my knowledge of aviation at the point. That, I mean, I, we were the anniversary of the first flight of the Concorde uh, or of Concorde for, for sticklers here was, uh, was very recently, I think last week, and chatting about, you know, not being able to fly in that. J Jason, you didn't you didn't fly in the the Concorde, did you? No, no. In fact, my neighborhood was actually one of the extremely vocal local um, organizations that protested the the start of Concorde and actually delayed it by what was it at least a year from being yeah, introduced yeah. into commercial service. Yeah, that was my neighborhood. Oh dear. Yeah. Uh, in, in any case, uh, that's one of my big aviation. You know, w wish I had been able to. Yeah, I, I had flown its replacement, the A318 baby bus, but uh, it, it pains me to know I will never fly on the actual BA1. Well, we were that's the episode. There you go. We're recording on March 10th, which is the two-year 
marks two years since the crash of Ethiopian Flight 302, the second 737 MAX crash in just a few months' time, and kind of the beginning of a years-long saga that has culminated recently with the reintroduction of the aircraft into commercial service just a, a few months ago, so so nearly two years since uh, the second crash, the airline or the aircraft spent grounded uh, as Boeing and regulators worked to understand what went wrong with the aircraft, what was wrong with the system design and how it could be corrected, correcting all of that, and then putting the aircraft back into service. So now we're we're two years two years since since that crash the aircraft is back into service in north america in south america europe and i suppose one operator in asia uh, scat recently restarted service uh, a few weeks ago with their their singular max 8 but the i guess the big 737 there's two bits of 737 Max News, and both of which came out, thankfully, before we recorded this week's episode. So, so Which is I wanna... a rare event, literally minutes before we hit the record button. Yeah, it's usually I... the other way around. Exactly. I, I want to thank Southwest and uh, for – well, it's not even – you know. I want to thank, uh, I think, uh, Reuters for, for breaking yep. the news prior to us recording. But I also want to thank uh, John Ostrauer for – his interview with Tim Clark prior oh to us recording because that, that which one do we talk about first? Talk about. Well, let let's set it up by talking about what's in service so far, and then we'll talk about what Southwest is, uh, what Reuters is reporting Southwest is about to do. Uh, we don't have official confirmation, but we're seeing it from multiple sources, so it, it, we'll stick with it for now. And if we have to come back in two weeks and say we were wrong, I, I won't feel terrible about it. And then we'll we'll talk about what Sir Tim Clark has to say about about Boeing and and what they've been up to. But back in service this week, tomorrow the eleventh. So by the time the podcast comes out, it will we'll be a, uh, a day into it. We've got Southwest bringing the aircraft back. They're returning their seven three seven Max fleet to service with some dedicated routes for the first month. So it'll. The routes that they'll be operating on will just be 737 MAX routes. There won't be any crossover. You'll know if you're on a MAX and it, there's there's no chance that – or the, if, if you're scheduled to be on a 737NG, there's no chance you'll end up on a MAX. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to do it, at least for the start where that's a possibility. I can't imagine that lasts too long at an airline the size of Southwest, though. Right. They've said they're going to do it for a month. So, so I, I, I recognize that they're trying to uh, assuage people's fears or, or make people feel more comfortable or, or something like that. Um, but you know, good, good for them, I guess. Um, but they'll do that for a month and operate them on some dedicated routes. And then after that, it, it, things will kind of open up after, I, I guess, the end of April or about the middle of April. Do we know what those routes are by chance? We do. I don't have the, the full list in front of me because they, they were released and then they changed slightly, but I can find the link and drop it in the in the show notes. Perfect. But they're 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 kind of all over the place. It, it's not uh, they're not keeping it to just, you know, the kind of the X Texas or anything like that. They'll be they'll be spread out. But but we'll put a link in the show notes. So on the heels of, of that, today what Reuters is reporting is that Southwest has finally reached an agreement with Boeing for up to 300 737 MAX 7s or the, the Dash 7, 130 firm orders with an option for 170 more. Knowing Southwest, I, I would assume that they'll probably take all 300 eventually. Yeah, uh, Southwest has a, a, a metric ton of 737-700s of the NG family to replace in the upcoming years. And Ian, we were talking about this before we hit the record button, that it, it really feels like the MAX 7 was an aircraft produced solely for and to meet the needs of Southwest, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, n nobody wants the plane besides Southwest. Their WestJet had 
orders and and pretty much got rid of them. So that's that basically leaves Southwest, and I think there's a handful of others. But it, just looking at the Southwest fleet, the the seven three seven seven hundred is by far more than double the seven three seven eight hundred current in the fleet. Seven three seven seven hundreds four hundred ninety two seven three seven eight hundreds two hundred and seven and and the max is uh, almost up to seventy. Yeah, so not a ton, and I'm I'm looking at Wikipedia now, not the greatest source for this kind of information, but there are only two known airlines on the order books for the Dash Seven, and that would be, of course, Southwest, who previously had thirty on order, uh, bumped that number up by another three hundred. And WestJet with 22, and it's not even clear that WestJet will actually follow through with those orders. They probably will not at this they, point. Uh, yeah, they just reduced theirs by 15, I believe, this morning. Uh, it was either yesterday or this morning where they've reduced their max orders by 15. Not a well-loved aircraft outside of Southwest's flight profile. No, but there, there's always a chance it'll see orders come along. I mean, we've said the same kind of thing about the uh, Airbus A330 Neo 800 variant, that nobody wanted that. And, and we've seen that aircraft get picked up by a number of airlines. I think most recently, Garuda dropped some information that they were they ordered uh, a couple, not many, a couple uh, 800s, which is right, a surprise. Right. I mean, it, th- this is one of it those things. Happen. It will happen, but it, it with the, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because it, it, it puts it kind of into perspective as far as the build process goes. I mean, it doesn't, Airbus, is, as far as Airbus is concerned, the 800 and the 900 are frankly interchangeable as far as building them goes. I mean, you, you can, you can order one or the other, it doesn't matter. So there's no, there's no, cost for an airline to order just one as far as Airbus is concerned. I mean similarly with with the Max 7 there there's you can order any any type of mix so it really doesn't matter if they don't order them in bulk which I I think you know really speaks to what Southwest is doing with the their 737 700 replacement and ordering the you know up to 300 we'll we'll call it 300 you know, uh, max sevens. Yeah. So the, the, the smaller variants of these aircraft may not be the most loved or most wanted, but there, are, there is a need and a place for them somewhere at some airline. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Some outlets are, are pointing to this as a very, very big win for Boeing mm-hmm. in the sense that there was competition between the A220 and the 737 MAX. I know has okay. Well, Jason, Jason made it easy. I was going to say I'm hesitant to buy into that. Jason just doesn't buy into it at all. I guess. No, I mean, of, of course, Southwest is going to go out there to the marketplace and see what's what, and and see what other competitors are willing to offer. Um, the A220 and its variants being the closest match to the 737-700, but. It realistically, I don't think there was ever a chance that Southwest, um, the actual all Boeing aircraft, not Alaska, Southwest, <laughs> um, there was no chance that Southwest was going to defect to the A220. It just did not make any sense given that they are in fact an all 737 airline and they already operate the MAX. I'm sure this was great negotiation tactics to lower the price and Southwest probably got a hell of a deal given everything that's going on. Uh, I'm not even going to point at anything specifically, just everything that is going on right wildly. now. I am just gesturing wildly out the window at everything that's going on. It did not make sense for Southwest to do anything else other than go back to order more maxes. This was an inevitability in my mind, but it was sure fun to watch the uh, turbulence along the way. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very... I think that's a very good way of putting it. Thank you. It was it was fun to watch the turbulence along the way. Yeah, I mean, perceived competition is is always a very interesting thing, where you have to and and every time Ryanair orders aircraft, we, I was we talk just about gonna say that. I was just gonna say O'Leary always brings up Comac and the C nine one nine as competition for Boeing. None of that's real. Yeah, Let's be serious. I mean, None it, of that exists. But the, the whole idea that they could take 
Airbus aircraft or, or, or something like that. We, we you know, with, with the O'Leary saying, we, we might buy A320s. Well, they tried that with a lot and they got rid of them and it didn't work and, and moving on. And then they went and ordered, you know, 200 more 737 MAX. So that perceived competition, I, it's tough to take it seriously. I mean, especially yeah. when you're selecting. So I guess I would love to be a fly on the wall at Boeing going, how serious do we take this? We know this is a negotiating tactic. We we don't think they're serious about that, but we have to oh, pretend yeah. that they're serious. Yeah, I would just be interested in being a fly on the wall for that. Yeah, this is why I'm not in sales. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So that sets up the, the kind of the where we are with the 737 MAX and Boeing's push for the aircraft to return to service. That sets up, I think, one of the most important interviews I've seen with someone in in aerospace and aviation with the, within the past maybe year or two even. And that's John Ostrower's interview with Sir Tim Clark, who is the, um, the, the head of Emirates. And he had... He had things to say. He had things to say. It, Tim Clark has stayed on. He was set to retire. I believe he's 70 years old. And he was set to retire. And then, well, a pandemic hit. A bloody pandemic. In a his bloody pa- Yes, in his words. And, and so he has stayed on at Emirates. But he... I, I think, and and Jason, we were talking about this a little bit before we were recording about how when when certain people in the industry speak, they are listened to, but what they say m- might not be taken at face value. Tim Clark is not one of those people. He no. he is as is someone who has been around, has has done a great deal. You know, not just for for Emirates, but but for aviation in general has driven Boeing's wide body development has driven Airbus's wide body development and has kind of laid the groundwork for for a number of airlines to follow and so in his conversation with John Ostrower I was struck by just how frank he was. And so if you haven't uh, subscribed to to the Air Current yet, we for probably the 15th time suggest that you do. John's not paying us to say this, but he doesn't have to because he gets he gets these interviews and then it's I think really important to give a, a little glimpse into what some of the things that Tim Clark had to say. So I'm going to start with uh what I there's two quotes in this entire interview that I, I think are really really encapsulating of, of where we are. And this is this is one of the quotes about the Boeing Board of Directors from Tim Clark. Culpability for the culture, strategy, direction, priority of that company rests with the Boeing board and nobody else. And that's where the buck should stop. And that's where they need to get themselves sorted out. Uh, he continues, so going forward, the relationships that airlines have with the likes of Boeing will be conditioned by what they see they are doing to sort out their internal problems. Oof. Yeah, that's that's one. And then here, here's the second one uh, that I, I think is kind of really the kicker. Why was this allowed to happen? Why didn't you listen? Was this, we were too arrogant, too maverick? Did we know it all? Who can tell us? We are Boeing. No, all that has to change. A little bit of humility. Understand what you look like from the outside. Yeah. He didn't say anything that I can disagree with. No, no. He is summed up in those two poll quotes what I think a lot of people have been saying about Boeing for the past two years at this point. But it it cannot come from anyone more significant or, or, or more, I guess, well known or in a position of power than Sir Tim Clark. The man, as you said, Ian, he has really helped shape Boeing commercial aircraft, at least the wide bodies um, to this point. Remember, Emirates was supposed to be the launch customer of the 777X, which is indefinitely delayed at this point. They are, 
I believe, the world's largest operator of the 777-300ER. Mm-hmm. So Emirates has a lot of sway at Boeing, and he is clearly not happy with the fundamental behavior, the culture of safety at that company. And he it, it is clear from those quotes that he does not believe that the corporate culture at Boeing has actually changed. That, yeah, it's interesting to me that Boeing thus far has said no we're there there's been no grand sweeping gesture from Boeing. There's been no act of contrition. There No, it, it's basically been hey, we've changed. Take our word for it. And right. when we ask, can we talk to you about it? They go, no. No. Just take our word for it. And and I don't I'm not a Boeing customer. I don't buy airplanes. <laughs> Petro Air does not operate yes. Boeing Air. Well, we do, but they, they were produced in 1967 or earlier. Uh, oh. Remember, our, our fleet is is one of the the oldest in the world for a reason. It's a good but, tech plan. <laughs> oldest in the world for a reason. I just, as a communications professional, and as someone who who charts kind of a, a public face and a public course, I have yet. To understand, and I'm sure there's you know a, a lot of deep history here, and and some very good reasons for why Boeing has done what they've done over the past couple of years, but I still don't understand it. No, and I will remind everyone that although Boeing says they have changed, uh, when they forced Muhlenberg out as CEO, uh, they replaced him with someone who was already sitting on the board of directors for the entire duration of the 737 MAX program. So it's not like they brought in fresh blood, somebody new to oversee Boeing and write the ship. They installed a CEO who was helping to steer the ship to the port that they were already in. So it's really hard for for me personally to believe that they changed when they just put someone in power who was already guiding the company to the position they're in now. Yeah, and that that's a big chunk of it. And and the other part of it is what beyond fixing the airplane, which which I believe they've done. I mean, almost 2 years of work. Almost I mean because it's not just the FAA this time. It's not reciprocal certification. It's the FAA. It's Transport Canada. It's EASA. It's the Brazilian regulators. It's China still not certifying the aircraft, saying they're still not satisfied. Certainly, some of that is, is part of a separate geopolitical discussion that, that we've had in the past and will certainly have again. But various national regulators or or supranational regulators in the case of Europe saying, this is what we've got and and we are satisfied. So so that part. I'm not concerned about as an engineering led effort. What concerns me is kind of the the additional information that's come out, not just the 737 Max, but look at the 787 quality issues. And you know, as far as Tim Clark speaking, they have 787s on order. And I as a customer, I would be concerned if all of the aircraft being produced for me could possibly have a defect. Yeah, I think Boeing is only starting to start the uh, process of delivering 787s next month even, so I still don't think they're actually delivering 787s yet. Yeah, and and so we're in the midst, I think, of of a a long period of Boeing figuring itself out. And none of this is to say that I don't think they will, and none of this is to say I don't want them to. I want them to succeed. No, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I want them to build the next great airplane. I want them to to build whatever comes next, whatever the NMA eventually becomes. I want to see that, and I want to fly on it. And and I I want them to be around. I want them to get their house in order. I would very much like to be able to say Boeing, yes. Yeah, and at this point, though, that's just not the case. Right, that's that's just not the case. And and for Tim Clark to to come out and say this, I I think is just, I don't I don't know if it's wind in sails or taking wind out of sails, but I, I think it's huge for him to come out and say this. 
Yeah, especially since I'm I'm sure the man has lots of actual day to day dealings with Boeing. Um, I don't know if he just has an axe to grind from the last few years, or if he's uh, burning all the bridges behind him on his way out of the industry. But this needed to be said. He has said what others have not been able to say, especially people, even very outspoken people in the industry. Um, you're probably guessing who I'm thinking of, but um, there's another <laughs> CEO of a Middle Eastern airline, a neighboring country that is generally quite outspoken, but has not really said much about this situation. Yeah. And and so for, for Tim Clark to come out and, and say something like this, I think it carries it carries a lot of weight in the industry. I, I think, I hope it carries a lot of weight within Boeing. And we'll we'll see what what comes of this and and whether or not whether or not anything you know comes of this w- w- with Boeing or not John posted a follow up to his interview that Boeing has now officially declined to comment yeah probably best so let's move on to an update on United Flight 328 and an update there. Uh, the NTSB continues its investigation, and we'll put a link in the uh, in the show notes to some updates, some additional imagery that the NTSB has laid out, as well as a uh, an updated narrative after interviewing the pilots. Uh, so we learned a little bit more about what the pilots were doing uh, on the flight deck and, and some interesting information there. But what I wanted to talk about today was the revised, or not revised, but the, the airworthiness directive that the FAA released earlier this week. So this supersedes the emergency airworthiness directive and adds a bit more information. And last time on the podcast, we were speculating about the the hours and cost of what it would take to inspect all of those all of the blades, the fan blades on, on the the Pratt and Whitney engines, the, the affected 4000 series engines. And the FAA now helpfully provides estimated costs in its updated airworthiness directive. So the action that the FAA is requiring, it says that it uh, estimates that the airworthiness directive affects 104 engines installed on airplanes on the US registry, which is interesting because we've talked about airplanes that are stored versus airplanes that are active. So I'm I'm not exactly sure how they're they're breaking this down as far as our our aircraft that are are stored at this point maybe just not coming back into service because of the cost. That that'll be something that we'll wait and see. But they estimate that it takes 22 work hours to inspect the fan blades. They provide a labor estimate cost of $85 per hour. And so the cost per product is $1,870 for a total cost in the US operators of $194,480, which is is lower, significantly lower than I thought it would be. Yeah, I think this I'm speculating, I don't know, you maybe you can correct me that this is only the the physical act of inspecting the fan blades. This is not the the time of the aircraft being grounded, of course. It, it, correct, I don't think it accounts correct. for uh, maintenance staff uh, getting all of those fan blades out of the engine on the aircraft. So two, obviously two engines per aircraft, packaging them, sending them out, and then doing it all in reverse, putting all the fan blades back on the engines. That cost probably mounts up quite uh, a bit higher than what uh, Pratt and Whitney is saying right. there. This is this is just the, the cost to do inspecting. the inspection. One, once Pratt and Whitney has the blades, here's how much it costs. The the other bit of info. So if, if there's damage to the blade, they need to be replaced. This is why roughly half the value of an aircraft rests within the engines after it's been you know put through its useful life and has reached you know the the time when it's it, it's either time to to scrap it or or part it out each first stage blade on the Pratt and Whitney 4000 series the FAA estimates the cost to be $125,000 aircraft engines are not cheap one blade $125,000 oof so uh yeah I cannot afford to purchase a, a blade. 
And that's just the uh, that's the blade. That, that is not yes. That's just the fan blade. That just is, the first stage. The fan blade. There is, are other sets of blades that, inside the engine. That is, and that is just one of the blades. That's not the cost to install it. That's not the cost to inspect. That is just the the purchase price. You walk into the fan blade store at the Pratt and Whitney <laughs> warehouse and say, "I want that one." That'll be one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Now, the question becomes, can you put that on the corporate credit card and do you get miles? Oh, uh, I guess if you're a United employee, you're going to want to go in there and use a United Mileage Plus credit card, right? <laughs> <laughs> Again, not an ad, just a joke. Y- yeah, I, I, I don't know how that works. But I mean, I, I'm not shocked by that because I know these things are you know millions and millions of dollars. But just when you part it out, when, when, you, when you specify the cost of each individual part and go, huh, one of those fan blades costs, you know, roughly half a house or- And there are how many in a single engine? And there are two engines. And there are two engines. That's a lot of money. That's just the first stage fan blade. Yeah, that makes uh, bird strikes and bird ingestions. It uh, does put things in a whole much, new light, doesn't it? Worse. Yeah, yeah. I, every now and then we see reports of like, oh, there was a bird strike. That could be millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah. So we should do an episode of the podcast for I- the insurance industry. That'd be fun. Aviation insurance. I'm going to make a note of that and, and we'll try and find somebody because I, sure. I would love to know how that all works out. Are, are bird yeah, strikes but- covered? Definitely take a read of the investigative update that the NTSB NTSB put out on March 5th. It it, it has some insightful information, some bits and pieces of information like that the the FDR indicated that the engine made an uncommanded shutdown, which is, that's interesting. Yeah, that the fire warning didn't act didn't actually turn off until well after the crew discharged both fire bottles on board, which I'm led to believe is because that's uh, temperature driven rather than actual fire being uh, active fire. But there's a, there's a lot of interesting information in that first initial report from the NTSB. Yeah, we'll we'll have a link to that in the show notes along with some of the photos that uh, the NTSB has has released as well. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back from break, our colleague, uh, Gabriel Lee, sat down with Air Baltic CEO, Martin Gauss, to talk about how Air Baltic has has made it through the pandemic, uh, including becoming an all A220 airline basically overnight through a, a choice that they, a direction they were going, but their hand was was certainly forced. So when we come back, we'll enjoy their conversation. So stick with us. We'll be back in just a moment. So Mr. Gauss, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for this interview. I wondered if we could start off with a little about how the past year has been at Air Baltic. Obviously, complicated times for everyone, especially if you're running an airline. So I wonder, what did you have to do to to sort of change about how the airline operates? Is there anything you wish you'd done differently? That kind of thing. Yeah, it was an interesting year uh, behind us. And exactly a year ago, we came to the week where we had to stop flying completely as one of the only airlines uh, in Europe at that time, because to protect uh, Latvia, the government decided uh, international uh, air traffic will be stopped. So we stopped completely for 62 days. And What we did in this time, at that time, was everything we knew about the pandemic. We focused only on staying, then revising our product for the future, and then we prepared to grow. That was the focus at the time. Uh, We did that very successful, took strategic decisions, and then we went into this year. And after the 62 days, we had a big relaunch, a new start, and there was a, a lot of a hype for people to fly again. And uh, we had a very big success until we came to the early summer when for uh, the virus, it slowed down again. And where we are now, one year later, we are at the lowest possible level. So we are ensuring basic connectivity, but we are flying uh, very little. And we are now waiting basically for the real restart, which will come. And that is, I think, now clear to everybody when sufficient vaccine levels have been reached in Europe. So that, that's after one year. We are here. We uh, made it. We are in a good and strong position. We did uh, a lot of changes to our strategy, uh, took a lot of decisions, became a COVID five-star airline uh, from a Skytrax rating. So very proud of that. And we are flying today 
in this COVID time a, a very reduced program, but we ensure connectivity. Yeah. I wonder, has the pandemic changed the overall strategy at Air Baltic at all, or the, the approach, aside from the obvious, aside from taking the necessary precautions, reducing schedules as necessary on a, on a sort of larger scale, has it changed the strategy? It has changed the strategy in the way that we had a business plan, uh, very clear communicated that we would be in the year 2023, retire uh, the Boeing and the turboprop fleet and have only the Airbus A220 as the only aircraft then. That decision was taken immediately a year ago on the day of the stop, basically, to stop all other fleets and only fly the Airbus A220. And that strategy change has changed our business going forward because it happened three years earlier than it would have happened if, if the crisis wouldn't have come. So that's the change in strategy. Apart from that, we, uh, as we can, could then focus only on the A220, we have only seen improvements because everything we wanted to reach three years later, we have already reached when we started again last year in May. Hmm, right. And that was going to be one of my questions. So, you know, now that you are an A220 only airline, I wonder, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's different right now because you have such a reduced schedule, but, but how is that working out? And, and do you ever sort of miss the the smaller size of, say, the Dash 8 or something like that to be able to swap around different uh, capacity of aircraft on different routes, that kind of thing? It works out perfect. When I go back, when we had the restart, we were just having one aircraft type. It makes things so much easier. Uh, everybody today is trained for that aircraft type. No, of course, there's flights when you fly only with a handful of passengers. There you could use a different type, but the complexity of swapping aircraft, not having the same speed, range, comfort. No, not at all. We are not missing at all any of the other types. We are very, very happy. And we're putting all efforts into make sure that we, for, for the future, will only operate that one type. It has so many benefits brought to our customers and to our operations that we would, if we could, would do take that step earlier even, knowing what we know now. Right. And I assume that passengers find it a, a positive development, those who are flying, to find that it's always going to be an A220 these days. Yes. And that was already, we were this operator where everybody in the world said that such a wonderful aircraft, when we launched the, the Airbus A220-300 as, as the launch operator, we got this tr global attention for such a wonderful aircraft and passengers were then writing to us, when will it be on this route and when can I fly? We had people booking tickets because of the aircraft in the beginning. And now all the customers know whenever they book a ticket on Airbotic, it's it can only be the A220, which still today, four years after we introduced it, is a state-of-the-art aircraft because it has this wide body feeling and a narrow body cabin. Right. So speaking of that, you you yourself are type rated. Uh, you're a pilot on the A220. I wonder what that is like being being the CEO and also able to fly the aircraft. Uh, that's the, the staple of the fleet. It makes me, first of all, it makes me very proud. I'm a pilot now for 29 years. I was flying 737s and I used the COVID year to finish my type rating on the Airbus A220. I'm, I'm flying now and I have to say it makes me extremely proud to fly in our airline. It also gives me a lot of uh, insight, which uh, as a pilot I maybe would have, but actually flying the aircraft itself gives you uh, on top of it a different insight. But the biggest benefit is that I, in the daily operation of the aircraft, I see what it is capable of doing. And if we look here at the highlights uh, of, of the aircraft, it's, it's uh, avionics, yeah, the capability, what kind of approaches you can do, all the modern technology that aircraft have uh, as a pilot, it's very interesting to operate. Hmm. Does having that insight to knowing what the plane is capable of, does that give you I don't know, new ideas for different types of service or different destinations to serve or, or broader ambitions for the airline? No, I would say that being the CEO, that's that's the key job. And I try to find with my team the strategic decisions. I, I don't want to be influenced being a pilot. We have very capable pilots in the management who, who can take that role. But of course, uh, it uh, whatever you do in life, if you do something which is different to your daily routine, you get new insights. And if you have ever taken off a jet into the sky, especially in winter weather, you're going through the clouds, reaching the sun, and then you're cruising and crossing uh, countries, it is very different and you, you have different thoughts. And of course, that, that influences you, everybody. But it's not, it's not uh, changing the strategy or influencing the daily job I do as a CEO. 
Right. How about in terms of flying the plane? I mean, you mentioned some things about it. Uh, is the A220, does it have any kind of idiosyncrasies, any unexpected characteristics, any, anything special about it that you could tell us about? Yes, if if you compare it to a 737 Classic, then uh, definitely uh, it has, uh, I mean, it, you cannot really compare it. And that's what pilots will tell you because the aircraft is the most modern uh, cockpit technology you have. But also th the way how you operate an Airbus A220 is very different to an Airbus or a Boeing. And uh, therefore the philosophy of operating the A220 is really state of the art. Pilots can, can tell stories about it. It's very much liked among pilots because it delivers a very high level of comfort, the aircraft for the pilots. Uh, it has everything you would wish for if you're a pilot. So today it has even too much navigation uh, equipment. Not, not, uh, you can't use all of the stuff it has because it's ready for the future. And, and in general, it is very comfortable. You can really focus on your job as a pilot to monitor what's going on because that's the job of today's pilots to monitor the operation, not so much the hand flying, but of course it also uh, has a very nice maneuvering capability if you fly by hand. But this, this aircraft is designed for the future. And as a pilot flying the Airbus A220, you're flying a future aircraft. Hmm, great. So if we move back to sort of the, the, the broader airline strategy, I'm, I'm curious, you know, if we do see, assuming we see gradual improvement from here, more vaccines, virus recedes, travel demand comes back, What's next for Air Baltic? What should we expect to see, the kind of big moves? Tell us about what the roadmap ahead is for you. It's very clear laid down. We have a, a business plan. It's called Destination 2025 Clean. Before it was without the word clean. And clean means we have cleaned out uh, the three fleets. We focus on that one fleet. We're taking on, we have 50 Airbus A220 on order total plus 30 options. Today, we have 25 of them. We take on seven this year, the next one coming in April. Then the following year, we take on more, and then we have to take a decision to execute options. We will take these 50 aircraft for the Baltics, mainly based in Riga, but also at the moment, two in Tallinn and in Vilnius, and that number increasing as we get more aircraft. And after the 50 aircraft, we have a very clear strategy to move out of the Baltics and also base aircraft in the Nordics, we call it. And uh, on the product, we will keep a hybrid model, which was very successful before the crisis, and I think will be even more after the crisis, with the 145 seats and a full business class combined with an ultra low cost cabin. I think we are perfectly set up. The aircraft itself comes with an excellent range because it can do very short sectors with 145 seats, more like a regional aircraft, but we can also fly it on very long sectors. For us, the longest sector is around seven hours from Riga to uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, now with the extension uh, possible on that aircraft, we can even fly from Riga to Addis Abeba or Delhi direct. So the aircraft is enabling us to do whatever we want to do, if it's about the destination, but we will keep what we have done very successful, a, a full business class where the middle seat or the seat next to you is free, but then also for the price sensitive customers, a very attractive uh, economy class. And would you consider flying to places like Addis Ababa in the future? It is not something we're looking at now. We're looking at it in the form that you look at any potential destination, but we haven't made a posi positive business case for that. But after the crisis, the whole aviation sector is changing. We see this now with a lot of airlines changing focus on aircraft types. Uh, everybody looking now for smaller equipment. We, we have the benefit of having probably the best small equipment, which can do both short haul and uh, up to long haul so but we are looking always at what is the next potential destination we will be serving 75 destinations this summer from riga and um, 11 and 11 from vilnius and tallinn but of course we are not limited and addis abeba would be now one where i say okay if, if somebody can make a positive business case on something like that we could fly it. The word sounds interesting from a Latvian perspective because it re it's really far away. That's If you are in Africa, this is much closer, but he here in Northern Europe, Addis Abeba sounds very far south. Yeah, that's it's ex potentially exciting times ahead then. I wonder if I might just add one more question to finish up. Curious if you, you know, many people are looking at this summer as a kind of potential where where there is a kind of bounce back in demand, maybe even a, a surprising level. I wonder, are you are you optimistic about, you know, at some point this year, seeing a kind of surge in, in renewed interest in demand for travel and getting out there and flying around? 
Yes, I definitely will see a surge. We can we can see that already because we had it when we we started flying after 62 days being grounded, and we had a surge, a, an incredible surge. Uh, people were storming the aircraft, and I would say that uh, we will have a, pro a luxury problem of having only 145 seats. And in the first week weeks when that surge comes, we will have the issue: do we have enough aircraft? I think it will then level out a bit because everybody now wants to go somewhere and it's mainly leisure uh, and it will level out a bit. So we will see a surge, but then I think we'll reach a plateau and then we will see a gradual increase. And for the business travel, that will take a bit longer just because of company policies and uh, businesses being very careful of restarting. But in 2022, we'll see that as well. When does it restart? It starts with the right vaccination levels in Europe and with the taking back the quarantine and self-isolation rules. That's the biggest thing stopping people to travel because you just cannot afford to be in a hotel for 10 days or 14 days to, to visit a place. I heard today, I'm not sure whether it's confirmed, that the Seychelles are opening and you will see immediately if something opens, people will go there. So whatever opens, people will try to get there. Of course, if you, are, if you can return and not self-isolate. So the self-isolation, which is needed because of still high infection levels, is stopping people to travel. But once there's a vaccine uh, and no self-isolation, we will see a, a very strong surge. Great. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Gauss, thank you so much. As always, it's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us and speaking with us today. It was nice speaking to you too. Thank you. Welcome back. And I, I really think that they've done a very interesting job in kind of shutting everything to, kind of going into hibernation mode as a small airline they can they can do that but what always strikes me as is interesting is the balance that they have to walk between three national governments basically being the the national airline for for three countries always a rough business when you when you've got that much kind of interaction yeah, definitely an interesting airline going from all of the uh, Q400s and then the old 73500s now to an all A220 airline. That's a major, major shift. And it, yeah, I mean, modernization overnight. That happens. So the big news in aircraft leasing is that Aircap and GCAS are, well, not merging. Aircap's buying GCAS because. GE wants to get rid of its aviation leasing business because uh, there's a lot of debt there, $30 billion worth. So now there's consolidation in the, in, in the leasing business. And I think, Jason, you've got some, uh, some stats laying around. Yeah. This is a major, major, major deal. This is – some people have compared it to like American United – Delta and WestJet all merging to become one as it's that big a deal. But Aircap has 1,080 aircraft owned or managed with 289 on order. GCAS has 984 aircraft owned or managed with another 255 on order. Uh, so this is a, a fairly large chunk of the entire global fleet are owned and leased out by these two companies. Most airlines do not buy their new aircraft outright. They're, they're owned by some sort of leasing company who ends up leasing it to these airlines. Or there might even be cases where they're sale and lease back, where an airline owns an aircraft and they sell it to one of these leasing companies and then they lease it back. Um, but this is a, a very significant deal and a further divestiture of uh, GE out of the space. GE has really pared down pretty much everything it does. Really, just leaving its uh, engine operation, I guess. What's left? What does GE do? Light bulbs? That refrigerators, maybe? Maybe. I, I think my fridge is GE. I mean, there's there's still plenty there, and and if if you work for GE, we apologize. But as far as aviation goes, they they yeah they they really really pared back. Yeah, so that that's a a major major deal. It's like David and Goliath getting together, and then the rest is all just like little ants all over the floor. Um, <laughs> I, I can't uh, imagine that this won't see some sort of regulatory hurdle along the way. That this will just go through without any sort of objection. But we'll see. We will see. Other kind of uh, aviation business news that that we will we will rush through in, in our sprint to talk about uh, more planes and things like that. Amazon has invested or or has exercised some warrants in 
ATSG, which is the cargo carrier that it leases aircraft from already. It leases aircraft from ATSG and and Atlas Air for its Amazon Air subsidiary or, or business, uh, which is thoroughly confusing because the planes are painted with Prime Air. Mm-hmm. But it's actually Amazon Air because Amazon Prime Air is now going to be their drone delivery service. And it's all very, very confusing to me and I don't like it. But which of those things will deliver a beer to me in under two hours by drone? That's Amazon Prime Air. Oh, perfect. Okay. That's the one I'm going to look into. So basically, this is a, a further entrenchment in the air cargo business as Amazon looks to be kind of an an inexorable march into starting up its own airline. So that seems to be where these things are headed. Who knows how long it takes them to get there? Or if they turn on a dime and say, no, we're not going to do that. Several uh, people have also pointed out that Atlas Air has a chunk of this invested as well. And Atlas Air does operate uh, passenger flights or or uh, not commercial, but charter flights. Um, So Technically, Amazon is invested in passenger flights, albeit very indirectly. I don't it's, really buy they're, it. Though. They're there for the cargo. I mean, the, exactly. They're, they're they're the, the, the passenger aspect is incidental. Yes. Let's see. What else do we have? Ah, in in welcome news, I think all around, uh, not just for the aviation community, but for for lovers of uh, wine, cheese, scotch. scotch uh, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, various fruits and nuts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> Where are we going with this? <laughs> I don't know. The US and EU uh, have agreed kind of uh, to, to a truce. For uh, for now on tariffs, um, so the aviation angle of this is that the Airbus Boeing tariff dispute is is paused and will hopefully be amicably resolved at some point soon, because it, it was just getting ridiculous. Delta was taking deliveries of A three thirties and flying them to Amsterdam and then not flying them into the US. And so they were dealing with getting around the tariffs by not importing the aircraft within a specified time frame. And it was just, it was a little ridiculous. Yes. So hopefully- now, now, <laughs> now that president business is no longer in the White House, um, airlines can actually start taking delivery of aircraft that they have purchased without paying. How much was the uh, the tariff on the, it was significant, right? It was, it was something nearing 300% or or something like that. When we were talking about the the C series or A220 now and dealing with other Airbus aircraft, it was and and vice versa. I mean, the some of the other you know things going the other way kind of retaliatory. It was just getting ridiculous. But Nobody been, wins in that situation. That's been suspended. Yes, that's been suspended, and and hopefully they can f- find a, a resolution resolution there. Jason, hmm. tell me about. <laughs> Lufthansa's elderly aircraft. Oh boy. Well, if you are a fan of um, elderly multi engine wide body aircraft, your favorite airline is not going to be Lufthansa anymore. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> <they've>, <laughs> That's a, a fantastic way of setting this up. I love thank it. Thank you. The Lufthansa Group, I will say, not just Lufthansa, the Lufthansa Group, they will fly anything, or previously they would fly anything. But going forward, the primary aircraft in the Lufthansa Group fleet will be the 777-300ER, the A350-900, the A330-300, and the 787-9. And I also can't forget the A350-900, but that means that the 777-200 is gone, the A340-600 is gone, the A330-200, the A340-300, the A340-600, the 767-300 on the freight side, the MD-11 freighter, also the A380, not an old aircraft, but four engines, and Lufthansa Group no longer likes four-engined aircraft. They're all gone. They're never coming back. It's a phase-out of eight inter- eight eight intercontinental aircraft types that will be permanently withdrawn from the Lufthansa did, Group. Did we mention the 747-400s going away? I don't think I did because those are not in the graphics. That because they had already uh, – They're already gone. Already sent those away. But the, the, the Dash 8s will stick around. Um, yeah, so the Dash 8s stick looking around. looking to fly a 747 as a, as a passenger and not as a box, you still have some options. 
Yeah, oddly, uh, Lufthansa did not put that uh, the seven four seven dash eight or the four hundred in their graphics uh, of what is being uh, removed or kept. But yes, the dash eight will remain. The four hundreds will not. And if you were a box again, the MD eleven freighter is not long for this world at Lufthansa. And as far as the group is concerned, if the aircraft is older than twenty five years, regardless of whether that type of aircraft is sticking around, those will be going away. Very quickly, there there will yes. be no there there won't be a return to service for those, even if there is a a periodic return to service for some of these aircraft before they are retired as as a fleet type. So so if you're old, you're out. Uh, as far as the Lufthansa Group is concerned, you're going so, to petrol air. Exactly, exactly. So I'm picking up thirty, roughly thirty new aircraft. I think it's twenty nine aircraft in the Lufthansa Group fleet. So we're talking Lufthansa. Lufthansa Prime, I guess. Sure. So Lufthansa, Swiss, Austrian, and and Brussels are the network carriers, and then you have Eurowings, kind of uh, over there, the the other operator of of wide body aircraft. Sad. Indeed. What else do we have? We've got the the last CRJ was delivered to Delta, or not yep. delivered to Delta. It was delivered Sky to Sky West, West in operating for operating Delta. Delta. Or will be operating for Delta. So that was the 1,945th CRJ, and that is registered N840SK, November 840 Sierra Kilo. And, yes, and it uh, is currently vacationing in, in South Bend for some reason. One, as one does. Uh, I'm not sure why the aircraft was delivered from Montreal to Nashville, and then later that day went Nashville to South Bend. I have no idea why. Maybe SkyWest has some sort of base there to to fit the aircraft out with a, an interior, which I think it should have the the atmosphere interior that, that Bombardier was trying to push at the very end as a refreshed interior that this aircraft will have with Delta. I think Delta is the only airline that took it up actually, or one of the only. But that is the end of the line for the CRJ family of aircraft. But I'm sorry, the Mitsubishi regional jet. <laughs> Who started up operations in Australia? Rex. Well, technically not. Rex or already who started airline. 737 operations. There you Australia. go. It's still Rex. It's still Rex. Spoiler alert. Yes. So Rex had put into operation just this past week uh, a few 737-700s that previously belonged to Virgin Australia, who went through bankruptcy and divested a whole bunch of a well, majority of their fleet. And now that fleet is being used against them in the form of uh, domestic flights being operated by by Rex. And, and interestingly enough, the interior of that aircraft looks like it could still be operating for Virgin Australia today. There's not <laughs> much of a change on board. All divested aircraft can and will be used against you. Exactly. I'm pretty sure that's in the Miranda right somewhere. Yeah. I'm going to leave that one alone. The last two things I want to talk about. One, I can't believe it's actually happening. Breeze. I love this topic. <laughs> Breeze is breezing. They're They're going. They are they the Department of Transportation has said yes you can operate flights uh, yes so clearly the biggest hurdle along the way and becoming a, a full on something Baltia was aspect. never able to achieve yeah I'm pretty sure that was my choice though <laughs> but this we, this is still a big deal. This, a whole episode yeah that. this means that Breeze can officially start passenger service it, it is still not ready to do so it doesn't even have an IATA code you can't actually book a flight its website is only basically career postings at this point but it is one step closer to becoming a reality i mean yeah you you don't you don't go and get you know a certificate of, of public conveyance if you're not serious about things. So, you know, it, welcome news for for just the industry as a, as a whole. I'll, I'll take it. I saved my favorite story of the week for last. Yeah, I thought it was going to be your last one. Your favorite topic's not Breeze. No. I saved my favorite story for last. So we don't normally talk about military aviation in here, but sometimes things are so ridiculous that we just have to branch out. And... This week, Steve Trimble 
who used to be on our side of the aviation fence in in, in the commercial business, but has since gone on to to be uh, an ace reporter on the defense side. Uh, he was, was sitting, undercover the whole time. He was undercover. He was sitting through a presentation that DARPA was giving, and they were talking about how they were having Wait, who's DARPA. Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's a an arm of the U.S. government that is tasked with inventing really cool and often very scary things. So, if you want to go down a rabbit hole as far as uh, things that have been invented by the U.S. military, DARPA is the is the place to start. They're the arm uh, of the d- defense industry that that comes up with with good ideas. And so their good idea this week was the the folks who fly the VC-22s or the, the V-22s, um, the, the tilt rotor aircraft were having problems with, with brownouts uh, when they were landing. The dust was so thick that they couldn't see and that was causing issues uh, with being able to land safely. So what DARPA invented or or came up with was what they're calling engineered living materials. Huh. Elaborate. To to reduce the dust in landing zones for these aircraft. The engineered living materials are, among other things, self-repairing. I know. uh, (laughs) you're, uh, You're wondering what we're talking about. At this point, you go, hmm, that sounds like some sort of fascinating new invention. It must be that, nanoparticles or some yes. sort of nanotechnology. It really turns out that DARPA came up with planting some grass. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they invented grass. Meanwhile, at the White House, the new Marine One keeps burning that grass. And they can't land it there because it keeps burning the grass that they for some reason have in place of a helipad. Maybe it's time to just put a helipad in. Weird. I am looking forward to DARPA's new super intelligent nano powered grass. <laughs> Engineered living materials. Your tax dollars at work, everyone. Oh. And on that note, this has been episode 108 of Av Talk. Thank you so much for listening. A programming note for those who are not yet subscribed. Research shows that when we say subscribe, people think it costs money and it doesn't cost any money to listen to Jason and I. It costs you nothing besides time that that by the end of the episode, you're probably wishing you had back. But Apple is doing away with the subscribe button as Google and Spotify have also done, have already done, and you can follow this podcast. Oh. In any case, subscribe, follow, religiously download each fortnight, whatever you do, by all means, please sign up for the automatic downloading of the of the podcast onto your device so it's uh so it's easier to listen to and to tell your friends. Leave us a rating and or review uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, this podcast, and we very much appreciate it. I am Ian Pechnik, here as always with Jason Rabinowitz, and I am off to buy some engineered living material helipad landing zone stuff. Good luck. Good luck.